Well, that's the magical bell. It sounded, so we'll get started. Award you all for being on time. Thank you. Just welcome to our class today. Welcome to the services. And I know we celebrate Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection every Sunday, but this is the time the world celebrates it, and, and we're, we're happy for that too, and the attention that, that uh, Christ gets. So we're glad you're here. We, we're just thankful for this time that we have together. We're going to be studying today in Acts 28, the first 10 verses. So if you want to be turning to that, we'll get to that in just a, just a minute. Um, my name's Scott Melton. I'm one of the uh, shepherds here. I'll be leading the class this week and next week. And then Greg will be wrapping up. And then we'll be moving on to Romans after, after Acts. And uh, Joe has gotten us real good material. So the same group of four teachers will be teaching a book of Romans after we wrap up Acts. I have a couple announcements to make first, and then we'll have a prayer, and then we'll get started with class. Um, in, your, in the uh, bulletin, you'll see on the back side here, there's, there's going to be a class on scams, and that's this Tuesday night at 6 o'clock, and I'll be leading that. I, I give credit to Bill Pinnock. Last year he came to me and he said, you know, it wouldn't be a bad idea if we had a class on scams. He mentioned someone, and I knew someone, and I actually got a scam. So several of us have been getting these scams, and so it's good just to stop and maybe look and see kind of what, what's out there. And the whole purpose of scams is that uh, just that you, you, we talk about it so you'll be on the alert. So if you get something like that, you'll kind of have a heads up that, uh-oh, this is something not right here. I better not, better not go down that road. But uh, it'll, be, it'll be 6 o'clock. Well, We'll start here. If we have a small crowd, we'll move back to the green room. But if it's large enough, we'll just have it here in the auditorium. And it shouldn't be more than 45 minutes to an hour long. Uh, but uh, welcome. It, it, it was designed for the young at heart, but the whole congregation is welcome because it's good information for everyone. So we encourage you to, to come if, you, if you're having interest in that. The second thing is that next Sunday... Um, after services, 11.45, we'll be having a ministry fair back in the gym. And that's just important because all the deacons, all the ministries will be having tables there to share with you. And if you're, if you're new or you just say, you know, what's going on here? Well, how can I get involved? I'm going to get more involved. This is a great time to do that because all the ministries will be set out there. I have two, so... Since I'm up here, I'm going to take advantage of this time. I have two that, that, that I'd like to kind of promote. One is a new ministry called LED, and that stands for Local Evangelism and Discipleship. And that's simply, we're putting the Great Commission, Matthew 28, into action. You know, there's teaching on both sides of baptism. We have teaching before baptism to help convert people, and we have classes on teaching you and, and giving you, sharpening your tools on how you can study with people. Those classes will start up in this room back here on Wednesday night. We'll start that here at the end of April. And they'll start running. And, and you can pick and choose. If there's certain skills that you don't have that you like to have, we'll, we welcome you for that. And then we also have mentoring and tutoring. Mentoring and tutoring Christians, new, new converts. And if, you're, if, if you think you would like that, I think there's several in here. I think it would be marvelous tutors for our mentors, for, for uh, maybe less seasoned Christians and mentor them and families. And there's, there's just an opportunity for everyone. So if you have an interest, please come by the booth. Mark Elmore is leading that. Um, I, I'm the shepherd over that, but we would love to have, have you involved in that. And then the second ministry is something that has been around for a while, but it's new to Robinson Avenue. It's called World English Institute. And it's where you have an opportunity. All you have to do is have some sort of device where you teach students around the world English. But the beauty of this and why it's a ministry is that all these English, when they're teaching them English, you're also teaching them the Bible because all the lessons are from the Bible. And so you could, be, you could be carrying out the Great Commission by teaching the Bible just by grading. And he's not in here. Mike Thomas is leading that ministry along with Kayla Haney. And Mike has close to 80 students that he teaches now. And he says it takes probably no more than 15, 20 minutes a day because he, he, he just grades their lesson. He grades it on his phone. And you know Mike's disability, yet he can do that. 
And so that's something that if you have an interest in that, again, that's a great way that you could be spreading the gospel. So if you have an interest, please go by and see Mike. Toronto will be there on, on, at the ministry fair. Go by there, find out more about that ministry too. But there are several ministries that the, this congregation has to offer, and they'll all be on show next week. So please make plans. We'll have a light meal. It'll be, I think it's pulled pork sandwiches and chips. We'll have a light meal. So please, I encourage you to, to come for that. Oh, that's a great that's a great tool teaching bill said that he was aware of the world trade center where, where uh, when immigrants came in that there was the church had, had a booth set up there where they were ta- teaching immigrants and that's just a great opportunity but you have a similar this is run by the church a congregation up in um, washington state and then they also have an office in maryville tennessee and they they oversee this ministry but it's a church-run ministry and it's something that if you have an interest in that please uh, check it out a little further well, I want to draw attention just to our, our members that are, that are on the sick list. They're on our bulletin, and we'll uh, pray for, for them now, and then we'll get started with class. Let's bow, and we'll go to God in prayer. Father, we pause just to give you praise for being our God. And Father, we, when we look at the cross, we see just how awful... Our sin is, which, and by the punishment that, that Christ took on our behalf, and we see that. And Father, we just thank you so much for the, for the gift of your Son and Him taking that punishment in our place. And Father, we praise you for that. But yet at the same time, we look at the cross, we see your love by giving your Son your love for us. And Father, we know that you love us and you provide for us, and we praise you for that. Father, we Thank you for just our ability to the common bond that we all share because you first loved us. We're all loved by you. We're made in your image, and yet we can do life together here at Robinson Avenue, and we thank you for that, and we praise you for that, and just pray your blessings on us as we seek to give you glory here in this community. Father, I thank you for the opportunity and the privilege of prayer and hold up to you these that on our prayer list and those that may not be on our prayer list that need 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 you and you know our you know our prayers your spirit audibleizes our requests on our behalf sometimes and we just thank you for that and hold them up to you lord and again thank you because of the gift of your son that we can approach your grace your throne of grace in our time of need and we just thank you for that father i thank you for your word and i pray that that we will trust you and we will trust you so much that we will build and, and direct our lives based on your word and your teachings and we thank you for for people that you've given us like Paul that you've worked through to to write and instruct us and all all the authors in the in the Bible we thank you for things written aforetime they're written for our learning and we thank you for that thank you for Luke thank you for just your your direction to us through your word and may we take that seriously our responsibility to be good stewards of the word you've given us and help us to study so that we can do your will and we can teach others and reflect a life that leads others to you father i pray for this class today as we look at acts 28 and may we benefit from it and gain valuable lessons and just bless this class as it's taught and just pray that it'll be conducted in a way that pleases you and just benefits those here to give you glory in all that we do. It's in Jesus that we pray. Amen. Okay. So, if you've ever watched, and, and, and I've confessed to you before in class that I'm a, I'm a, um, I don't watch a lot of reality TV, but one that I do watch I was going to say religiously, which is probably not the right term, but I watch very regularly is Survivor on TV. Have we got any Survivor watchers here on TV? I mean, in, in here? Uh, it's very successful, very successful TV series. It's on its 40, wrote it down, it's on its 48th uh, series because it's been so successful. And what they do is they put people out on this remote area 
And now they've gotten where they like Fiji so much, they put them out in Fiji just every time now. But they're, they're not given much to eat, and they really have to survive. But if you look at the lesson that we looked at last week in Paul in, in, in Acts, last part of Acts 27, look in 28. That's a true survivor there. Two weeks. If you're in a boat and you've lost, and, you, and you, as you're going along, the boat's falling apart. I, I think of the, the movie The Perfect Storm. The ship's falling apart. The sails are going. You know that your time is limited. It, it doesn't look good for the home team here. As the, and, and we're going to see through, through God's provision that uh, all 76 of the people on that ship survived that. So that's the true sense of survivor. And so that's where we take up today in verse 28. I mean, in chapter 28, where they're on the, they've landed a ground on Malta. But before we get there, I want to look at one thing. Before we go there, I want to look back in, in chapter 27, something that we talked about last week. Right, right as we ended, Joe Mahorn asked the question, so what can we gain from this lesson? What is something that we can apply in our lives? And so the, the answer, and it was the right answer, the answer was, well, the provi- we, we learned that God provides, and we can trust in God's provision. In one way, I want to look at that a little closer. I'd like for us to look at Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. And I'll read those for you. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to Him, and He will make your path straight. Okay, so keep that in mind as we I want to look now at verse in chapter 27. I want us to look at verses 9 through 12. Got the map up here. And so you can kind of be looking at the map on Paul's journey. I know it's a little far away and I apologize for that. But but they've been in storms and the boat is now in verse 9 here, it's at a place called Fair Havens in Crete, in the Isle of Crete. And I can kind of show you up here with the red dot, maybe. Maybe not. Operator error here. There it is. Crete's right here. They've come all the way up here. They really started hitting some storms, but now they made it to a place. It's kind of ironic. The place they're in is Fair Haven, but yet there's storms all around. They've ported there. But here... Here is here's the scene that I want us to look at again in verse 9. Much time had been lost. Selling had already become dangerous because by now it was already after the Day of Atonement. So Paul warned them. He said, man, I can see that our voyage is going to be disastrous and bring great loss to the ship and cargo and to our lives also. But the centurion who was the commander of, of, you know, remember this on the boat here were, were sailors, prisoners, because prisoners being taken to Rome, and, and guards and soldiers and sailors. That's primarily who was all on the boat. So the centurion was the main person over the guards, and he was in charge. So the centurion, instead of listening to what Paul said, followed the advice of the pilot and the owner of the ship. Since the harbor was unsuitable to winter in, the majority decided that it would be that we should sail on, hoping to reach Phoenix and winter there. This was a harbor in Crete facing southwest and northwest. So here, look, so here they are in Fair Havens. All they wanted to do, this is all they wanted to do, they just want to go just a little bit. There's Phoenix. Probably, I looked at it on the map, you look at the scale, 30, 40 miles at the most. That's all they wanted to do. And then they said, okay, we're going to settle down there for the winter, wait out this storm, wait until there's better sailing conditions. So that was the logic. But Paul, the man of God, said, no, if you go further, you're going to have great law. So here's the centurion. You've got, and remember Proverbs chapter 3, trust in the Lord or rely on your own understanding. So that was the reasoning. How many people would go on to Phoenix? 
I think I would. I mean, that makes perfect sense to me. They have a better harbor for the boat. It's only going to be 30 or 40 miles. We've already made it. This, look how far we've already made it. Yes, there's bad winds. But then you look in verse 13. There was a gentle breeze blowing. Okay, this is good. This is our sign. We can make it. This is our sign. Let's go. We're only, gonna, we're only going 30 or 40 miles. How many times in our lives do we face the same thing? We know what God has to say. Then we have our understanding, what the world says. And the world says, oh, you can do this. This is easy. You don't have to, you know, this may be one exception to the rule here. There's always exceptions to every rule. So let's don't do this. And so the centurion, he makes the decision. He goes with the owner of the boat, which makes pretty good sense. The owner of the boat and everyone on there said, you know, let's, the sailors said, yeah, let's go to where there's a better port. To, 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 but there was, it wasn't like they were trying to go the whole way to Rome. It wasn't like they were trying to go. It wasn't like, oh no. It wasn't like they were trying to go uh, all the way up here to Rome. They were just going right here. So that seemed to make pretty good sense. But again, I think that's a valuable lesson that we can draw from this. Is that here the man of God, Paul is saying, don't. Stay put, stay here. But yet the centurion said, okay, I'm going to go with reason here and I'm going to go. And what was the result? They hit a horrible storm, awful storm. You see the perfect storm. It's a horrible storm. They get in. They can't even make it. They can't even make the turn. They can't even make the turn here. They get, they get drawn out here past this little island here and out, and they're in trouble. So now I want us to look in verse 30 and 31. So here's another decision. I mean, this, the boat's falling apart. They've kind of run aground. By this time, they're all the way over here. They're, they're getting close to Malta. And the sailors sense this, and they say they're getting close to ground. And so in their reasoning, they say, okay, now's the time to cut the lifeboats. And make a run for the land here. Now's the time to do this. That makes sense to us as sailors. We've been sailing all our lives. So that's sense. So you've got common sense, your own understanding here. But then you've got Paul saying, I want to tell you now. If you go, these people are going to be lost. If you stay in the boat, we're going to lose the boat, but everybody's going to survive. So that's the decision. So you've got the man of God here. You've got... Trusting in God, and you got relying on your own understanding. So what does the centurion do in this situation? He's learned from the last situation. He's learned. He says, okay, we're not going to do that. We're gonna, I'm, not gonna let, I'm not going to let them get on the boat. So they cut them free. They didn't let them get on it. So he listened to Paul this time. And then in verse 41 and 42... So now they've run aground, and this is terrifying to me. They've run aground, but it makes perfect sense. They've run aground, and so now they said, okay, those that can swim, go ahead and swim for it. We're not very far. We can see the land. Go ahead and swim for it. We're still 100, about 100, several hundred yards. you still got to swim. But those that can't swim, get onto the debris from the boat and float in. So now the soldiers, put yourself in the soldier's situation. They're, they're, they have to give an account for every prisoner. Is there a chance that a prisoner may be lost? Is there a chance that a prisoner may be escape? So in their mind, okay, we're going to go ahead and kill the prisoners now because there's a chance that they could lose their lives. So they were going to take the prisoners' lives. That, that horrifies me. That includes Paul. They're not going to have their day in court. They're not going to have their day that they were going to up in Rome. So again... The centurion makes the final call here. Do I listen to what God says here? And God didn't instruct him, but, but the plan is that everybody go ashore. Or do I listen to, do I rely on the reasoning? He again says, okay, no, don't kill these men. We're all going to go ashore. Because Paul has said that everybody is going to make it if you follow my instructions. So again, that's another, another example. So... I guess I bring up all that just to say that one of the valuable lessons from last week is to, to trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. 
And how many books in the New Testament has Paul written to us today? Several. So in our daily lives, we need to look to Paul, look to the other writers of the New Testament, see how we live our lives versus what the world is telling us to do and what maybe may sound right to us, leaning on our understanding. So that's a valuable lesson. And we touched on that last week, but I just wanted to kind of flesh that out a little bit more as we start our class today. Okay, so let's read the first six verses, and we'll jump in for today. In chapter 28, verse 1, Once safely on shore, we found out that the island was called Malta. The islanders showed us unusual kindness. They built a fire and welcomed us because it was raining and cold. Paul gathered a pile of brushwood, and as he put his hand on the fire, a viper, driven out by the heat, fastened itself on his hand. When the islanders saw the snake hanging on his hand from his hand, they said to each other, This man must be a murderer, for though he escaped from the sea, the goddess Justice has not allowed him to live. But Paul shook the snake off into the fire and suffered no ill effects. The people expected him to swell up or suddenly fall dead. But after waiting a long time and seeing nothing unusual happen to him, they changed their minds and said he was a god. Okay, so what was the name of the island here? Malta. So they made it over here. took two weeks to make this. I don't know what the usual time is. I guarantee it's not two weeks. But it, So through this storm, it was treacherous. They've run aground here. They don't know where they are, but I think when they found out they're in Malta, they should be pretty happy most of the trip. <laughs> I mean, they've made it, they've made it pretty, good, pretty good ways, but they made it to Malta. Let's, let's talk about what Malta's like. Okay, Malta is a very small island. It's 20 miles long from east to west and 10 miles long from north to south. And this island had immense rock. It was known for its white sandstone. But over the years, they had brought dirt from Sicily in about a foot of dirt and covered the whole island with dirt. And so they, it had, you had about a foot of dirt, but it was mainly rock. And so there weren't really any trees or timber on the island. And that, that will come up here in a minute on how they got, how they got the wood. Because a lot of people have tried to look at these verses and say, okay, there's got to be something wrong here. Or Luke's account, they try to attack Luke's account. But the word Malta comes from the word Melita, which means honey sweet in Greek. And so it's named by Phoenicians. So I'm thinking, okay, where are the Phoenicians? But Phoenicians, that's what people from Phoenix are. So these are sailors from Phoenix. They're the ones that founded this island here in Malta. And it had grown. There were several people that lived there. They had a governor. We'll, we'll learn more about him in a minute. But the Phoenicians had called this island Melita, which means honey sweet. So any ideas on maybe how they got that name, honey sweet? This is totally speculation on my part. I didn't read anything that told me this. But, but, if, you, but if you look at verse 1, what was the reception that they, Paul received in others? You know, they probably witnessed them struggling in the water. And these are people... They're described as natives, and even, and we'll talk about this in a minute, they're described as barbarians, but we'll, we'll explain that in a minute. But how did they react? How did the people react to, uh, in verse 2, how did they react, the people, when Paul and them came ashore? They showed them extreme kindness, sweetness. I'm, I'm thinking that the people, that maybe they named this honey sweet because the people were so sweet and kind and nice and good natured. Maybe I'm wrong on this. Maybe there's some other reason. But you can know that the Malt Maltese are very good natured people, especially in this instance when they welcomed, welcomed Paul. Who knows? They could, you know, when I think of barbarians, I think they could have been cannibal. You know, they could have tied them up and had a, had a, had a barbecue or whatever, you know, with all these people that come ashore, but they didn't. They really extended them a, a great deal of kindness. So in verses 2 and 4, 
in, in the King James Version especially, they use the, the original word for natives. Here in, in, in NIV, and maybe you may have other, other different, uh, I think NIV says islanders, but some other translations say natives. And that's probably a more accurate description of these people. They were just native to that land. The King James uses the word barbarian because that's what the original Greek word was from. But the Greeks say barbarian just to mean that someone that spoke a different language than Greek. So they're not this uncivilized group of wild people here because they called them barbarians. These are people that, were, that had a level of civilization and sophistication, but they just spoke a different language what is thought than just than, than Greek. So that was why they were called barbarians there in that case. So then we see where Paul, that raises another question then. So if they spoke a different language, we see that Paul was able to communicate with them. So there was some level of communication because we see from Luke's account, he's able to, later he's able to, to when he's bit by the viper, he's able to say, okay, they said this, and they thought this, and they thought that. So there was some level of communication. So we, we don't know exactly that, but so that's just a question that we don't, don't really know. Um, let's look at verse 3. What time of year was it? It was in October and November. So that means it was, it was, it was not particularly warm. It had been raining several days, and the people that landed ashore, all 276, were just soaking wet. Didn't have anything other than the shirt, maybe the shirts on their back. They were soaked to the skin. They were waterlogged. If you've ever been that way, you know. And the wind's blowing that you had to be chilled to the bone and shivering. And so, as an act of kindness, what did the, what did the, the people, the natives of the item do? They built a fire. Now, what I'm thinking is, how did the fire continue to go? Because it's raining, it's storming, but they were able to keep the fire going. But I think because there were 276, it had to be a pretty big fire. And what does fire require? Fire requires wood. And we talked about there really wasn't any timber on the island, so where did they get the wood? That's what I'm thinking. That's what I'm thinking. Diane said driftwood. I'm thinking, if you've ever been on the beach there, a lot of wood drifts up there, and you can... And if they're smart, they, they, they probably stack that up. If you're like me, in the springtime, over the winter, I stack up leaves and wood and stuff over in the corner. Springtime, I better be careful. Because if I go in there and lift up that and, and clear it off, there could be a, 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 yeah, some type of friend in there <laughs> that has made a home in there. If I'm not careful when I pick it up, I've found none before. To be careful, you uh, you see me dancing a jig out my yard. <laughs> well, I lift them up, and there's a snake there. But so that's probably what happened in this case. Um, they probably had they probably had some wood driftwood set aside for this very occasion, and so that required them to to go and, and build this fire. So I want to focus on on that just for a minute. Just put yourself in Paul's situation right here. You've been on a ship for two weeks, storming, just the anxiety of that. Of course, now Paul, Paul knew Paul's, Paul knew God's promise. But you know, and he just swam a hundred, or had to come several, several hundred yards in from the boat. I would think he's pretty exhausted, I think. That would be my guess and the others. But what did Paul do? I mean, and Paul is... A chosen one of God, he's also a prisoner. It would have been easily easy for me, for us, if we we're in that situation, just to sit back and say, "Okay, Islanders, you're awful nice. You're serving me. I'm going to let you build the fire and let you serve me." But yet, Paul didn't consider himself above anyone else. He showed great. I think he showed great example of service and humility by helping go pick up sticks. Okay, we're all building this fire. They started the fire, but I'm going to help do that. So I think that's, that's a small little th example of Paul showing his character and, and going and picking up, picking up the sticks. Okay, so here's another issue that people that are attacking Luke's account. 
On the island of Malta today, there are no poisonous snakes. No poisonous snakes on the island today. So they said, okay, that's a problem here. Because you're saying there's a poisonous viper that, that leads onto his hand. They all said it. But that's not to say back in this time that it wasn't there. I mean, the, after that, it's, it's a pretty heavily populated area for a small, very dense population. From Paul's time to the present time, they could have killed off all, all the poisonous snakes. They could have floated. That's a good point. Diane said they could have floated in with the debris. Could have floated in. Because the area, there's some of the most poisonous vipers in the Mediterranean area. There's some of the most poisonous vipers known. known. So whatever the case is, I don't, I don't think that discredits Luke's account here. The fact that Paul was bitten by a viper. I mean, that was his account, pretty literal, that it latched onto his hand. I think this was a miracle that we're seeing in place. And I think that people can't discredit that account just from the fact that today there's not any poisonous snakes there. They have snakes, and there's not any timber there because it's on rock, but they have some dirt. But again, we think that the wood drifted in. I think there's very logical explanations to, to bolster uh, Luke's account of this. So what did the Maltese think about this snake bite? So Paul reaches in, you can just, let's just kind of visualize it. He's got a stack, he's got a stack of wood, he's helping out, he's helping everybody. They're, they're getting along, they're happy, they're getting warmed up by the fire. He lays it down. There's probably, the snake was probably either in his load or in another load, but when he lays it down the fire, the snake goes, whoa, it wakes up and said, whoa, this is somewhere I don't want to be tries to jump out, the nearest thing is Paul's hand. So I can see that happening. So it, it, it just attaches, this viper attaches to Paul's hand. And so what does Paul do? He shakes it off into the fire. The snake dies. But yet, what do the Maltese, what do the Maltese think? What conclusion do they draw? That was his punishment. You know, he, they probably knew by now with the soldiers in the prison that he was probably a prisoner. They didn't, probably didn't, they, I'm speculating here, but they probably didn't know what he had done. But they probably, they, they probably knew that he was a prisoner. And then when this happened, they said, oh, he probably did something really, really bad, like murder. And while he was spared from this storm... He did something so bad he shouldn't be spared. And so their God is justice is what they said here. It's going to make sure he doesn't live. And so it caused him to be bitten by this poisonous snake. That was their reasoning, which makes pretty good sense. It makes pretty good sense to me that they would come up to that conclusion. So has anybody seen the movie Apocalypto? It's a, it's a movie directed by Mel Gibson it's in the Mayan, back in the 15th century Mayans. But the scene that I've got etched in my mind here is this Mayan group of warriors are chasing this one native, Jaguar Paul is his name, and they're chasing him. They're trying to capture him because in his escape he killed the, 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 uh, leaders, the uh, leader of the Mayan warrior son. But anyway, he's, they're chasing him with all diligence. There's 10 of them. They're just going through the woods. They're about two or three minutes behind him they're chasing him so they go around a tree and they kind of pause just for a minute and one of the warriors sets his hand up there and a viper comes from around the tree and and bites him and they all step back and they immediately kill the viper well, then after that what they do they said okay your time's done they, they all wore a chain around the neck so they cut his chain they cut his because they knew he was getting ready to die and the leader of the group said, okay, we're going to go on and chase this guy. But he, he pointed one of his men to stay with him and see him out of this world. Because they knew it was going to be just a few seconds that he was going to die. And so the scene is that one, his fellow companion was sitting there. And he says, slit your wrist and I'll make it go by faster. So that, I, I tell that story because that, to me, that shows you how potent the bite and how these, these warriors knew that once you're bit by that, it's over. And I think that's what these natives saw. Once they saw that this snake bit Paul, they said, oh, he, he's toast. It's done. So when they kept going on and Paul just acted normal, then they said, whoa, there's something different about this guy. 
So then they came to the conclusion that he was a god. Which, remember earlier, people thought Herod was a god, and he took that to his credit. And what did God do? God struck him down. So if Paul knew that, Paul probably deflected that when they said that to him. But yet at the same time, you can see how they thought that. Okay, so let's move on to verse 7. And as we read these verses, there are probably more reasons for them to think that Paul was something special. There was an estate nearby that belonged to Publius, the chief official of the island. He welcomed us to his home and showed us generous hospitality for three days. His father was sick in bed, suffering from fever and dysentery. Paul went in to see him and after prayer placed his hands on him and healed him. When this had happened, the rest of the sick on the island came and were cured. They honored us in many ways, and when we were ready to sail, they furnished us with the supplies we needed. So there's, there's a little bit... Well, first I want to look at just real quick... Before we move on to this, look at verse Mark chapter six verses chapter sixteen verses seven and eighteen. This is Christ's prophecy at the end. Of, before he ascended into heaven, he said, "These signs will accompany those who have believed. In my name, they will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. They will pick up serpents, and they will drink any deadly poison. It will not hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick, and they will recover." Everything other than drinking the deadly poison we can see in Acts as actually taking place. And we can also see here, he didn't actually pick it up, although the serpent was bit on, that attached to him, that it didn't hurt him when he was bit uh, by the serpent. So that was, again, a fulfilling, fulfillment of prophecy from Christ. So when we look at Publius, his title was leading man and that was the official title of the governor of the island. So he was kind of the head, head person of the island. And he extended great courtesies. Luke says us in verse 7. And it's kind of hard to imagine that he, that he welcomed all 276 people out to his place. But he could have been. It's probably more likely that they maybe took the, the ship's owner, the centurion, Julius, Maybe Paul and Luke and, and the pilot and captain and some others were invited into the home. But it could have been all of them. But we see that Paul, through his compassion, has compassion on Publius and his father. And so he heals them. And this is, this is interesting to note. I, I mean, I'm always thinking that in every opportunity, since you have this power that, that you heal... But I don't think that's the case. We, there's some other writings where Paul says, I left some, and there's someone's name, and I don't know it, I left him sick. And so he left someone sick. And I think the commentators think that that may be a reason for prayer as you pray that, okay, is this, is, this, is this an opportunity for me to show your power to heal this person? So I think we, we see this a lot, that the prayer preceded them healing. And I think... You know, we're at the end of, of the healing, miraculous healing. We're near the end. We don't see Paul doing it much more after, after this. This may have been the last time that he, he used that miraculous power after he healed uh, Publius's dad and then some the people on the island. But, and also I wanted to point out in, in, uh, in these verses... It's more than normal, just the, just the medical terms. It's very technical. We use the term dysentery, and there's very technical medical terms. And why is that? What is, Duke's, what, is Duke, what is Luke's profession? He's a doctor. He's a physician. We know that from Colossians uh, 4, verse 14, where, where Paul says, Luke calls Luke, Luke the doctor, calls him the doctor. He's a physician. And so, and that's also in verse 9, it's interesting that he said, when they bought, brought the sick to them, they were cured. So it doesn't, that's not necessarily mean they were healed on the spot. They could have been, the situation. But Luke, being a doctor, could have given them the medicine or fixed it or whatever and helped them to be healed, cured as well using medical, his own medical 
uh, training to do that. So I think, I don't know, I think it's probably a combination of miraculous healing and Luke's just training to, to heal and cure. But anyway, the, the, the islanders benefited from that. So we're wrapping up here. There's no, do you think Paul taught? You know, there's no record. And this, it's kind of odd because everywhere in, in Acts, they always said, you know, Paul was very diligent in teaching, teaching the word, teaching the gospel. And these 10 verses, there's no really description. Luke doesn't tell us that he taught and there wasn't any result of him teaching. But do you, do you think he taught? There's not a right or wrong answer. I'm just curious. What? He was, by example. He was praying, so he was leading by example. I just can't help but think, when he's, if he's healing them miraculously, that he doesn't say who the source of the healing is from. <laughs> I, mean, I, I mean, I think he's probably going to give credit to God. He's probably going to give credit to God through Christ. So he's going to be teaching. I think he's going to be teaching that, Bill. Yeah, I think so too. When they said you're a God, he probably said, no, no, that's, that's right. So I want to leave you one, one thing. We'll wrap up here. We're, we're through our time. But the lesson that we can learn here, remember last week it was trusting, and we talked about the first of class, trusting God versus trusting God versus leaning on our own understanding. I think this lesson we also can learn from the, the natives that just despite cultural differences, lead with kindness. I mean, they didn't know these people, but they led with kindness. And that's an example that we, even though people may be culturally, uh, ethically different than us, we always should lead with kindness. I think that was, that was a lesson that we learned. Okay, we're out of time. We'll be uh, finishing up chapter 28 next week. I'll be teaching a class, and I look forward to uh, studying that with you next week. Thank you.